Thankfully, when it comes to how to create a food system that is better for the climate, in other words, where there's less greenhouse gas emissions associated with it, we have the solutions. We don't have to wait to figure it out. We know what that looks like. And what that looks like means really converting our farmland toward farms that are more, uh, more sustainable. And that means uh, cutting out the overuse of synthetic fertilizer, uh, cutting out the toxic chemical use, petroleum-based chemical use. When it comes to meat and dairy, it means going, uh, looking at our industrial factory farms and seeing them for what they are, these really inefficient ways to produce food for human beings. And, and so again, we, we have these solutions, we know how to do it. And the question is whether or not we have the, the political will to move in that direction because currently billions, tens of billions of our tax dollars are going to, uh, to, send, to essentially subsidize and incentivize a way of farming and a way of organizing our food system, which again is producing food that's bad for our bodies, but also has this really, really high cost to the climate. What we really need to, to spark is a public conversation that gets people to, to see and understand that just like we need to shift energy toward green energy and wind and solar being kind of emblematic of that, just like we need to shift transportation to green transportation to, to really uh, have our government build that infrastructure of high-speed rails and more, more, uh, more buses and more ways for people to not have to rely on the single occupancy car. Um, much like we understand that and are having that conversation, we need to have a similar conversation about what would a green food infrastructure look like. And what that would look like, again, it's not about us as individuals being able to do this on our own. It's about communities coming together, local governments coming together, the national government coming together, and thinking about how we can shift to more regionalized food system so that uh, it doesn't make sense for us in New York State to have to buy all of our lettuce from Washington State because we don't have the infrastructure to have the distribution for our lettuce growers in New York State. So we need investment in that and we need investment in that just like we need to invest in solar and invest in wind. And we're starting to see it happen at the national level with the Healthy Food Financing Initiative from the Obama administration. That's all about getting good healthy food, which is also good for the climate, into neighborhoods that don't have it. And what I'd love to see is initiatives like that expand bigger and bigger and bigger and also really in, in, include in them this connection between healthy food and climate friendly food. What we're really talking about and there's many of us that are really seeing how important it is to shift the way we grow food, what food we're eating, what we do with our food waste in a different direction. What it really means is having more food diversity, having more companies uh, in control of our food. Right now you walk into a grocery store, it seems like there's thousands of options to choose from and tons of abundance. What actually is true is that half of all that food in the grocery store is brought to us by just 10 corporations. When it comes to so many different aspects of food, whether it's meat packing or uh, grain milling, all of these different aspects of food, fewer and fewer companies have control over more and more of our food system. And so what me and many of our, my colleagues are saying is that in order to have a resilient food system, one that's better for the climate, better for our bodies, we need to have more people farming, we need to have more people in touch with where their food comes from, and we need to really think about how to create the infrastructure to support those farmers and bring healthy food into communities that currently don't have any access at all. What kind of farming, in your view, has no future that exists today? I would like to believe that we're, we're coming close to a point where we see the, the, the factory farm feedlot system for producing meat and dairy in this country much the way we saw the Hummer, which is an outmoded, outdated, totally, uh, totally irrelevant to our modern needs way of transporting ourselves. And we saw what happened to the Hummer. And I'd like us to see that in, in much the same way, the way we're raising meat and dairy in this country in factory farms pumped with hormones, pumped with antibiotics, pumped with chemicals, fed on genetically modified corn and soy, uh, that we'd see that system in much the same way. It's really inefficient, it's inhumane to the animals, uh, the workers are paid some of the worst wages in our, our, in, in our economy, the most exploited workers, and that we would see that there's another path, and that other path is a path where the animals are treated humanely, where they are able to live on the land and eat the food that animals evolved to eat, and uh, where, again, they have less of an impact on both our, our rural economies, uh, our environment, and also the climate. When we think about the urgency of the climate crisis, that we really need to start bringing down our global emissions, not in 10 years or 20 years, but today. 
When we realize the urgency, then I think it's all the more reason why food and agriculture comes straight into the spotlight. And that's because food and agriculture contributes a significant portion of man-made methane and nitrous oxide to greenhouse gases, which are much more powerful in terms of their global warming potential than carbon dioxide and have much shorter half-lives in the atmosphere. So reducing those gases today will have a greater impact on reducing overall emissions today. And when we have this conversation, what we also realize is that we need to be talking about this as a global community because so much of the food-related emissions are coming from just a handful of countries, Brazil, Indonesia, for instance, chief among them, because of the pressures on those rainforests in those countries by food producers, by palm oil producers in Indonesia, and by livestock production in Brazil. And so as much as we consumers in the U.S. need to think about supporting our local farmers here, we, need to support, we also need to be talking about and supporting a global food system that really addresses the connection between food and climate and starts reducing emissions from food and agriculture, not in 10 years, not in 20 years, but today.